On today's World Insight, China's 2022 economic work plan in the pipeline at a Beijing conference. What are the priorities amid a prolonged pandemic and global uncertainties? And the power of Olympic sportsmanship and camaraderie in bringing people together. Hear from the president of the International Bobsleigh and Skeleton Federation how the Beijing Winter Games can make a big difference. Then, for most, most of them, is the only chance to go to Olympics in, in entire life. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei from Beijing. Chinese policymakers have gathered in Beijing to map out the economic and reform plans for the year 2022. The conference, which has been held annually since 1994, is a key event as it sets the direction for priorities and key economic targets for the year ahead. The meeting agreed that China will comprehensively deepen reform and opening up with an emphasis on innovation. Also this year, China's overall trade over the first 11 months stood at 5.6 trillion US dollars, up by 22% from this time last year, with a 22% rise in exports. So what are the growth opportunities in China's economy's work plan? And what are the collaboration strategies amid a long pandemic? My conversation with the panelists. On the discussion of the Chinese economy, I'm joined by Wang Dan, Chief Economist of Hansan Bank China. In Hong Kong, Hong Hao, Managing Director and Head of Research at Balcom International. Last but not least, in Singapore, Bert Hoffman from the East Asian Institute of National University of Singapore, former World Bank Country Director for China, Korea, and Mongolia. Welcome to all of you. Mr. Hong Hao, I want to start from you. Tell us what might be the impact of the latest policy changes regarding the bank reserve ratio uh, for most of the banks in China. Is it going to unleash a lot of uh, vitalities and funding for the Chinese economy? I would be uh, uh, taking a cautious stance on you know, the latest tripwire cut. Uh, I think even though the uh, tripwire cut released a uh, fresh 1.2 trillion yuan worth of liquidity, into the system, but then you know, in the middle of the December, uh, you have um, uh, 950 billion uh, worth of MLF that is coming due. So you know, this money has to pay back uh, to the central bank. So I think the triple R cut uh, is really to offset you know this uh, MLF coming due, and I think the leftover liquidity could enter the system, but it's not that much. So I think the market, uh, you know, is per perceiving. Uh, this cut, you know, as a, a release of a fresh liquidity into the system. But I would say that, you know, people need to, you know, look at the macro picture, uh, even though the uh, growth is slowing, but it's still relatively stable. But then at the same time, inflation pressure is still building up uh, both on the upstream and downstream. So I would say, you know, even though, you know, the economy may need some help, uh, but uh, I think, you know, if you release um, fresh liquidity dramatically, it would actually uh, increase the uh, inflation pressure uh, in, in the economy. I see. I see. Dan, what's your take? Well, I do think uh, this triple R cut will lower the lending cost for commercial banks, and that is quite significant. Although I do agree that fresh liquidity additionally injected into the economy wouldn't be that much, but the overall lowering the cost would help the commercial banks to be able to lend more to households, to corporates, especially now we have seen this deterioration of liquidity situation for the property sector. And this triple R cut, I think it would directly help to relieve some of the pressure there. Mm. Recently, some of the uh, US listed uh, Chinese companies have been having quite some challenge as a result of changes in the United States in terms of uh, regulations and laws. And now, Mr. Hoffman, what does that mean for China's uh, uh, international approach, shall I say, uh, in this regard? What do you think will be the impact of that? Well, the trouble comes a little bit from both sides. It's both China's regulations as well as uh, U.S. pending regulations that might affect the international listing. 
I, I think it would be a loss for China and a loss for the rest of the world. I mean, one, one of the key reasons for those companies to list internationally is to actually aspire to international standards and international, uh, basically internationalization of the Chinese economy. And the Alibabas of the world and uh, uh, others, they have been doing that very, very well. And, and their internationalization strategy in part depended on that. Uh, if that were to be reversed, and I'm still hopeful that it won't, uh, that would be a loss for, uh, for, for both sides, for, for the world and for China. Mm. Mr. Honghao, of course, uh, after uh, having some troubles in the U.S. Uh, stock exchanges, many of the Chinese companies are moving to Hong Kong, where you work. So uh, what would that mean? Is the Chinese economy going to turn much more inward because Hong Kong, part of China, or this will be a temporary option? Yeah, well, it used to be that the Chinese company, like, you know, going to the U.S., uh, you know, for capital raising, you know, because there's abundant liquidity. I think the investors are more risking uh, and, you know, the valuation you can get in the U.S. market is, is quite good. Uh, but I think, you know, now with the regulatory change, you know, some of the companies may have to come back uh, to Hong Kong or may even go back to uh, go back to uh, the Asia market for listing. Now, having said that, you know, there is a, a grace period of up to two years. You know, within these two years, you know, you can choose to comply with the new regulation or, you know, you can choose to go back. Uh, and I think, you know, you know, with the new regulation, all you have to do, you know, is to uh, disclose your book and also disclose the uh, government ownership uh, in the business. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that um, those are, you know, some, some companies may choose to uh, comply with the uh, new regulation and some may come back. And, and for those uh, um, companies who choose to come back, many of them, uh, especially the leading ones, uh, mm -hmm. such as Alibaba, Baidu, and all that, uh, they have dual listing. Uh, in a uh, structure uh, in, in the market. Now with the US exchange trading volume is substantially, substantially higher than Hong Kong listing. Therefore, you know, the US uh, listing for now is the primary listing for many of these companies. But, uh, you know, one is it, it's quite conceivable that, you know, if these companies choose to come back, uh, you know, because of the dual listing structure, uh, people can easily right. exchange the US shares for Hong Kong share. And, and achieve a very smooth transition transition uh, for these companies to come back to Hong Kong. So I would say that, you know, with that in mind, uh, many of the investors in these companies uh, are actually uh, mainland Chinese and Hong Kong based uh, investors. I think uh, it would be more than half of them. You know, for example, the Futu, uh, um, okay. uh, uh, one of the biggest online uh, brokerage in China, you know, 50% of the overseas uh, trading account is actually uh, Chinese uh, accounts. So, you know, I would say that it, it would be easier uh, for, the, for, for these investors uh, to trade uh, if uh, these leading Chinese tech companies choose to relocate back to Hong Kong. So you got a lot of things going on these days, not only with the latest policies, but also with the latest development regarding where China is uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, so with that in mind, what would that mean, uh, Mr. Hoffman? Uh, about uh, the economic prospect and the policy directions that China likely to take for the coming year. It's going to be a big year for China. Well, I, I think we're at a very, very interesting point in time. Uh, the macro issues are still there and China's growth is clearly showing, uh, slowing. So uh, uh, China would have to balance uh, monetary and fiscal policies very well in order to maintain a certain level of growth. What that level is, I don't know. I'm sure that will be discussed at the Central Work Conference. But second, we've we, we've seen a lot of, uh, if you want, developments in in the new development philosophy. And and I think next year might be a big year for getting that onto the ground and to get specific measures implemented that would match that uh, match that philosophy. We've seen some in the, some some measures in the regulatory sphere over the past year. Uh, some people were a little bit surprised uh, by them, but, but they were by and large in the right direction. But there's a lot more to be done on the common prosperity, on the green, on uh, uh, the dual circulation, all these big terms, bringing them down to earth, I think is going to be next year's, uh, next year's agenda and beyond, because you can't solve these things in one year. Well, a lot of daunting tasks, isn't it, Dan? 
Oh yeah, all those tasks, I mean, they are very difficult to be done even for developing economies when they actually have the, uh, the tools and enough uh, capital to support that. And for China, I think there is also a very significant task on how to prioritize all those, uh, uh, all those things and how to reallocate resources. And now it just looks to me that common prosperity and climate change are on the top of the agenda. Um, all the other uh, segments in the economy uh, would have to somehow uh, adjust to this new reality. So the capital will be redirected to those most productive high-tech industries. And for some of the low-tech, uh, even if they can still provide employment, they're still profitable, they might have to suffer more um, just to make, make sure that we achieve the longer term goal. Mm. But uh, let me just ask you a little bit more in detail on the green thing. We did uh, have some uh, apparent power shortage uh, in the year 2021, and there were discussions about the speed of how to achieve green. China made a commitment 2030, 2060, that is for sure, but how to make sure the speed and the pace are appropriate, that's one thing. The other thing is about the common prosperity. On the one hand, common prosperity, but on the other hand, as after the uh, sixth session of the CPC committee, uh, during the press uh, uh, conference was uh, uh, indicated, it's not about sharing the wealth uh, uh, of the rich, but rather to create more wealth and to uh, reiterate the, the, the economy. So uh, these are very uh, delicate balance that would require wisdom and policies. Uh, Dan. Oh, absolutely. Uh, regarding the power shortage, I take a slightly different view. Um, because China has overcapacity in almost all industrial sectors. And once something is in shortage, that means some, the price is wrong for something. So we have noticed that, that for electricity market, there are about 60% of the electricity having the fixed price. That is the price fixed by the government. Only 40% were allowed to fluctuate based on market demand and supply. So this year, starting from September, more corporate, more regions are allowing electricity to fluctuate based on market demand, and they're allowed to go beyond the 20% uh, fluctuation rate. So that's significantly improved already from what the government has been trying to achieve uh, in the past 10 years. And then regarding the common prosperity, I definitely agree. We're not talking about uh, killing the rich and uh, or just getting more wealth from the rich and redistribute that to the poor. It's about the wealth generating ability for the low income people, especially the urban poor, since they don't really own any of the substantial assets, at least the rural poor still have the land. So that's a difference. And there has to be some direct subsidies targeting those urban low income groups. And I think the central bank digital currency can play a significant role in that. Interesting. How? Well, there are already pilot schemes in the past two years that um, the central bank distributing uh, or simply distributing cash um, using this central bank app directly to people's account. So they would know uh, what you have spent it on, when you spend it, and they would know your family income. So it's a very targeted approach. Um, there was a concern that this might cause uh, inflation pressure because we know that inflation is fundamentally a monetary phenomenon. So if you print more money or send out more money, the price level would go up. Um, but I do think for what we're facing now, this, the market has a very good industrial performance, but the consumption has been very weak for two years. So this is a measure that probably would to the best interest of Chinese people. Mm, we'll see how those uh, important topics are to be discussed uh, later in the year. Bert Hoffman, Dan Wong, Hao Hong, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate that. Thank you. You're watching World Insight. Coming up, the power of Olympics, sportsmanship, and camaraderie in bringing people together. We will hear from the president of the International 
Lobsley and Skeleton Federation, how the Beijing Winter Games can make a huge difference. Welcome back. I'm Tian Wei. This is World Insight from Beijing. China on Tuesday slammed the U.S. diplomatic boycott of the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics. The Chinese Foreign Ministry said countermeasures will be taken against the boycott. The White House announced that Monday will not send U.S. government officials to the Beijing Winter Olympics. In response, the International Olympic Committee had called on members to engage in sports to promote peace and dialogue. A nod to the universal appeal of the Olympics to bring all people together despite the pandemic and geopolitical tensions. With the Winter Games less than two months away, let's hear from an insider, president from the International Bobsleigh and Skeleton Federation, or IBSF. Now. It's not just a pandemic, it's also politics. And you heard about the recent nuance about uh, the U.S. Uh, suggesting making political gestures and some others also follow. Uh, but IOC put out a very strong and a very balanced statement. What about, you know, your sport and how do you communicate all these messages with all those athletes of your sport? You know, I say always my athletes, keep the politics out of the sport. You are here to perform the sport. And the sport is, um, let me say, uh, uh, clean and free diplomacy. We try to put the people together without some uh, impact of the big politics. I don't like when the big politics try to use the athletes. The athletes, they live all the life, the best years of the life for one week or two weeks, let me say, of the Olympics. And then for most of them is the only chance to go to Olympics in, in the entire life. And then they spend the best years of their life to go there. And then if some politician wanna have, uh, some, have some issues, they have to work on the political level, not in a sport level, please. I am in these things uh, absolutely a defender of the athletes, right? And, uh, and then sport. And the Olympic truth is something important to remind to the people. Keep the truth for almost one month because we have uh, uh, one week before uh, the Olympic Games and one week after the Paralympic Games. In this period, keep down, call the fights, try to think a different world and the sport can create a different world. Because if you go to the village, all the athletes, all the athletes, without distinction, they sit together, they talk together, they live together. And then so that is a, let me say, um, a perfect world that works just for two weeks, but mm. let this perfect world uh, be in place. But at the same time, because of the pandemic, there is a big uh, pressure on the Olympic movement, the International Olympic Committee. What do you make of these, uh, you know, economic pressure and pressures of uh, different kinds at this moment as the president of the federation? The word uh, flexibility is fundamental. No? Mm -hmm. And you have to understand, in a moment of crisis, there is a lot of uh, difficulties, but there is a lot of so, opportunities. Mm -hmm. So you have to work in preparation of the new future will come very soon. What do you because mean by day, the future in your case? I'm ready to reshape also my way to see my communication, my uh, marketing uh, actions. So try to speak now where everybody waiting i try to go to contact uh, the stakeholders say okay we are ready to prepare a new concept to present to our clients mm. spectators and so on so you have to work now to prepare tomorrow's or the future for my sport my federation reshaping you know instead to wait sitting down so oh, we wait something will happen no 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 we try to figure out our future I see that, okay, it's not easy, of course, but you have to be uh, proactive and then move forward. So uh, the world, the economy, everything will run again fast and fast. Mm. Be proactive. I think that's a, it's a very important principle at this moment. And what do you think Beijing, you know, making its effort to host this uh, Winter Games, despite all the challenges we mentioned earlier? 
You know, that show Beijing and the Chinese government, government have the vision of the future. They work to create something for the future. They are brave to take also this challenge because it's easy to have a summer, uh, summer sport, a summer of, uh, Olympic. Winter Olympics mean, and the first time ever one city have the summer and the winter uh, edition of the games is important. I think that show the government has a vision in the future to expand the quality of life of their citizens. Because also in the winter, 300 million people uh, practicing sport in China, it would be a huge, um, a, a huge step forward also in the, the quality of life of yeah. the healthy people. That's very important. So just make skating in some, uh, some small park, not just in Arbing, but also in other places. Uh, but you know, that show you think as a um, nation to the, the quality of life of your, uh, your citizens. As we know, um, this is uh, the very first time for Beijing to host uh, the Winter Games. And for China, many Chinese uh, have access to the winter games, uh, winter sports, mainly in northeastern part of China. But the majority of the Chinese territory did not have access to it. And yet, with Beijing hosting the first the Winter Olympic Games, you see that enthusiasm, you know, among this 1.4 billion. Uh, and, and people were talking about there's likely to be 300 million or 400 million that will be into the sport eventually. So what would that mean to your sport? And also, what would that mean when a country that did not have, you know, 100% access to winter sport could be, you know, in love with winter sport? What does that mean globally? Winter sport, there are different kinds. So if you do a cross country, uh, if you do my sport in general, okay, you have to be related to a relative cold uh, location. But also cross country, you can do that with the ski roll. So you can do it in South in summer for training. So, but you have also the chance to use for hockey or ice hockey. Mm. So use uh, some location in South because we need uh, some uh, sport facilities indoor. So you can do it now, you have to, uh, the idea to produce some, let me say, figure skating, fantastic athletes from the South of China from almost tropical uh, lands, because you have the chance to have there these, uh, these facilities, and then you can train there. So winter sport is possible to having globally if you use some indoor to develop all the rest. Mm. So I think it's a new way to approach winter sport. And then also for most of the Chinese people, the winter is not the bad weather. It's just the cold weather. So you can live outside, like for the European, for everyone, you can live outside and enjoy outside your uh, free time in a different way. Being the president of a federation that is one of the most popular winter sports uh, for the Winter Olympics, how are you and your colleagues preparing for that moment? But we, me and my, my colleagues, we are preparing uh, these games since seven years when uh, uh, Beijing won the bid, and then we start to co cooperate, coordinate our work with the organizing committee, Bokok. And I want to say, the work with Bokok was one of the best cooperation ever with the organizing committee. Believe me, it's something, you know, I experienced. I organized, I organized the games in Torino 2006 also, so mm. as an organizer. So the experience with Bokok was something unique, fantastic, really a great uh, cooperation and then uh, okay we have to face some problems but always with open mind that was a great 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 uh, moment so we, why, we why approached would you say so? i mean way. maybe people would say oh evil just being polite in saying so were well, there no, some no, no. stories you can share with us how it works uh, me everybody called me sharp because <laughs> me i said the things are very sharp so i don't have a uh, too many filter in, in this <laughs> regard so and uh but you know Again, we had a lot of discussion uh, regarding, uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, location of the venues or uh, the things. But, you know, the thing is, uh, and I was surprised because when we write some questions, okay, so, okay let's talk. No, normally said, oh, no, 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 and somebody, because they have decided, uh, I don't know, in a different way. I said, okay, let's talk. And frankly speaking, today, 
with the with the board of the organizing committee. I said, we are friends. Normally we fight in the last second, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> it's something to, to pull in these the regards and so on. But <clears throat> in particular with uh, John Dong, Mr. Mr. John Dong and Shuan in particular, wow, we are very good friends. Anyway, discussion always because we have a submission, but they always, uh, frankly speaking, very open minds. So I, I don't want to give flower to anyone, you know, I'm not the person. What I have to say, uh, I'm surprised we are the last mile of the marathon. Mm. And uh, well, the only thing I have to say, don't lose the focus because everything is good at the moment. How do you expect the athletes would perform? It's important to understand for athletes, when they understood the things, when they are focused in the goal, they don't care. They are already in their mind bubble and then physical bubble. So for them, it don't change too much. So you think there's they going to be ready. terrific uh, performance oh. this year? You, I mean, you will see 2022. It, you will see fantastic um, results in Beijing. Don't think that the level will be lower than before. No, 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 no. They will be extremely high. You will see some records that you, oh, wow, they did record also in this uh, particular condition. Of course, because the athletes, they want to perform, they want to win. So they, not because it's a pandemic, they reduce the, the level of training on the level of effort to win. They want to win. If for winning, you have to work more than the, the 100%. So, and then they will be ready in Beijing in, in February hmm. to show their capacity. No, no, no doubt about it. You know, we all have to adjust. The speed of adjusting almost decides on the fate of the speed to, you know, to succeed in a way. So it seems that you are the first to, to remind your athletes to be able to adjust and also triumph in a way. Exactly. You know, the word, I think the fundamental word is flexibility. Mm. You know, we have to be flexible. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, but we always did it in this way. No, no. When you think that nothing can change, you're already uh, blocked in your position. No? So mm. everything can change. And you see, with a crazy virus, nobody can see. We have to change our habits, our life, our economy, everything. So our freedom is different. And so that's the way to approach your life. Everything can change tomorrow and after tomorrow again. So if you are not flexible, you, you, you out. And in these regards, I think a good learning was from Agenda 2020 from President Park, flexibility and able to change. And so in, it is in, so the front of the, in front of the uh, office of Thomas Bach, president of IOC, there is a phrase on the wall, change or be changed. Well said. President of the International Bobsleigh and Skeleton Federation talking about the upcoming Winter Olympics in Beijing. That's all we have for today. If you'd like to see more Search World Insights or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Ken Wei on behalf of my team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.